I just uh, I discovered that uh, Sharon, we have been um, been responsible for this place, which was given to the Dalai Lama and Tibet House is his cultural center in America, mainly for the purpose of introducing uh, the Tibetan spiritual Buddhist medicine tradition in America, and. Um, but with all of its interconnectedness, it isn't really a religious thing, it's just a knowledge thing. And um, my wife Nina has been managing the place for 15 years now, since it was given to us. Lock, lock stock and barrel. My, as she always says, it's like winning the lottery with no cash. <laughs> on a big place. Just like an elephant falls on you out of the sky, and then you have to manage it. And uh, she's managed it really well for all these years, and uh, we welcome you to it. And all these 15 years, Sharon Salzberg has come here to elevate our spiritual level and to teach mindfulness and to share her glorious and kind heart. And uh, so we are so grateful for you, Sharon, and for coming here and for all that. And also you teach, of course, at Tibet House in the City that uh, she received the, those of you may not know, she received the Art of Freedom Award from Tibet House this, uh, to about a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And, um, yeah. and uh, actually, about five or six years ago, in concert with Mark Epstein, Dr. Mark Epstein, we gave her a, a Menla doctorate <laughs> of uh, mind psychology and mindfulness psychology, but we don't yet have certification, so it's, it's, on, a, it's on an astral plane. <laughs> she has a doctorate from us from up here, but that's less public. But um, we were delighted to give this Art of Freedom. You know, the Art of Freedom came from a British lord who was at the time the head of the London Times. And when the Royal Academy hosted our collection of Tibetan art that we organized for them uh, about uh, just more, like more than 20 years ago, um, there, the Chinese consul complained, you know, what is this Tibetan art doing there? What is this Tibetan thing? What's Tibet? You know, it's all China, you know, kind of that kind of letter. And he wrote this whole thing about how the art, Tibetan art, which is the Buddhist art of India, is preserved in Tibetan mountain there. You know, the, especially Mahayana Buddhism, but of all kinds, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. And uh, he said it's, it's the art of freedom is what it is. And he wrote this beautiful little essay, editorial, you know, to answer that. And he even said that some of the paintings here date from such and such a century, and the, and the amazing blues of the cobalt minerals that they use to like make the blue is still vivid and intense, such that you can see it in the exhibition. He said, and and he said, in that century here in England, the only thing we were painting blue was ourselves with woad when we went out for some kind of <laughs> druidic ceremony. <laughs> it was really a marvelous, a marvelous essay and his answer to the sort of wish to pretend that Tibet didn't exist as an independent thing, you know, in its history. So anyway, we're, we're very delighted, and here we are back again. This is the 15th, therefore, time. Oh, we probably did several in a year, so it's probably more than 15, actually. Yeah. But 15 times we've, we've done this together, and sometimes yeah, you've done it on your own, sometimes you've brought Krishna Das here. So, so Sharon is one of the spiritual directors of the place, and it's really marvelous to have her back. And since uh, the topic this time is real love, and since she has just finished a book called Real Love, which we have to wait for with bated breath until June, until it's available, uh, because of the way presses time things, um, I, you, you start things off. I, I completely defer to you to begin up. Well. We're talking about real love, and that's wow. your new book. And so wow. you're an expert on that. Whoa, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm always happy uh, to be with Bob and Nena and to be here. Uh, I wanted Michael to tell that story because I've always felt this is just a really special place. And uh, people often ask me to describe it. And I say, you know, I mean, it's got nice bathrooms, but that's not it. You know? <laughs> There's something else going on that makes it, for me, you know, a very, very special place amongst the really wonderful places that I usually get to go to. Um, and I'm, I'm just so happy to be here. I remember uh, Michael and I last year as we were, uh, Bob wasn't feeling well on New Year's Eve, so he was in bed, but we were 
bringing in the new year. And I remember Michael and I saying, oh, so many people had such a rough 2015. Like, aren't we happy? I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's completely meaningless in a way. I mean, it's a construct, right? This is the turning of the year. Um, mm -hmm. And being a Buddhist and a Jew, I get three a year. <laughs> I, know, I have the American New Year, I have the Jewish New Year, and I have the, the Buddhist New Year, the Tibetan New Year, you know, so. Uh, but it's, it's a, you know, the Tibetan New Year probably is the most reflection of something else, which would be some astronomical configuration, you know, but uh, I don't know what December 31st, you know means nonetheless it feels like it means something and it, it feels like it's a transition and it's it's a time of letting go uh hopefully letting go of burdens we feel we've been carrying and it's a time of moving forward into the unknown but sometimes with great resolve or uh, hope or um determination for greater balance or greater wisdom something like that and so we stood there on the eve of, of December 31st and said, okay, let's make it a really good year. And somewhere recently I was like, uh, I said, what did that astrologer say? I don't exactly remember. How long does it last? So I'm really happy he's coming back. Um, so I can press him. Um, and, and, you know, coming here in this particular time, it's also, it's very informal. I feel like we're all here just as friends and uh, for those of you, how many of you are here for the first time in this place? Wow. You know, it, like all places that are new, it can be confusing and don't hesitate if you have to go up to the desk. I was thinking this because I never know where I am. <laughs> My friends all tease me that that's why I like New York City so much because the streets are numbered, <laughs> you know, and it's like, where are we doing yoga? And, What's that seven-sided building? Like, just ask, you know, feel free always to kind of check it out and figure out where you're meant to be and where you're going. And, uh, and we'll just have a really wonderful time together. Um, I see Menla's got new chairs, that's fun. Are you all um, together? Is that a, yeah. So I have a Krishnadas story. Krishnadas is an old friend who uh, I met actually at my first retreat. I went to India to learn how to meditate uh, in 1970, and I began meditation in the context of this intensive 10-day retreat in January of 1971. And Krishnadas was at that retreat as a participant, and uh, Ramdas and friends like Joseph Goldstein and all kinds of people were there. So. Uh, and then in more recent years, Krishnadas and I have gotten into the habit of often going, trying to go to Dalai Lama teachings together. And so um, we were in Toronto in uh, some teaching many years ago in this exhibition hall, and they had these rows of chairs all locked together, extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Not like these, you know, very narrow. It was the kind of scene where the person on one side of you like tilted, you had a tilt too, you know, and so everyone was like really uncomfortable. And Krishnas was sitting on the aisle, and then there was me, and then this whole row of people. And uh, one day, Krishnas tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked at him, and he was like much further into the aisle. And he said to me, unhook your chair. And I thought, unhook my chair? I never thought of that. I just thought I had to stay here being unhappy. So that was my symbolic um, teaching for the entire event. So I don't know that you need to unhook these chairs, but because they look very comfortable, and they are very comfortable, and they're singular. Uh, they're unhookable. They're unhookable. Things can be done which is always good to keep in mind. Um, and I had something else come into my mind when uh, our wonderful yoga teachers were speaking. And I think that is, it's really like the spirit of coming together and learning, which means you, you can't really learn if you feel like there's nothing to learn or you have to be perfect at something, right? So that, that's a pretty forlorn attitude to have that, 
you know, to be embarrassed, sort of feel like, oh, it's not really, I'm not good enough at this. And nobody's good enough at anything. Um, so, uh, but when you were speaking, it reminded me of uh, many years ago, I have a, a retreat center I co-founded in Massachusetts, the <clears throat> Insight Meditation Society. In 1984, we brought a Burmese meditation teacher uh, named Sayada Upandita to come teach there never having met him before, but having heard he was a very great teacher. So I and many of my friends sat with him for this three month retreat. And he uh, was meeting us each individually uh, once a day, six days a week, just to very briefly to, where we would have a chance to describe our practice and he would give us some feedback and we know we would go on. and. Um, he got in, he had a habit also of sort of getting into these routines where he would tend to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again until something switched inside of you and then he would, he would switch as well. So when he came, I had been practicing for almost 14 years and I co-founded the center and it was like a teaching and, and uh, we just got into this routine where for a long time I'd go in to see him in the morning and I would describe what was going on in my meditation and he would look at me and he would say, well in the beginning it can be like that and I think, I'm not a beginner. <laughs> but that was his feedback. So that was all he said. So I'd leave. And the next day maybe I'd come in and I'd describe something completely different. And he would look at me and he would say, well, in the beginning it could be like that. And I was fuming. I thought, I'm not a beginner. But I didn't say anything and I laughed and like day after day after day after day. Whatever I said, whatever I described, he would respond with, well, in the beginning it could be like that. At one point I felt like I had a giant neon 14 in my brain and I was like flashing him. I'm not a beginner, I've been practicing for 14 years. And then one day, it's like I got it. And I remembered, oh, it's not insulting, right? Remember the whole thing about beginner's mind and you want that kind of openness and interest and you don't wanna feel jaded and you know what's coming next and you're only half-hearted and you want that complete presence and, and wholeness of, of being a beginner. I thought that's a good thing to be. So of course the day I got it was the day he stopped saying it. <laughs> and he went on to something else, so. Uh, I think there are many things, you know, in uh, whatever we are practicing, whatever we're exploring, whatever risks we're taking with our awareness, with our more uh, accustomed ways of being. Uh, it's great, you know, and you don't always hit that mark of like, wow, I'm great. Uh, in fact, my first instruction, which would be fun to sit a little bit tonight, even just for a few minutes, um, when I went to that, my first retreat in India, the first instruction I ever received was sit down and feel your breath. And as many of you have heard me say in talks or whatever, I felt very contemptuous of that. I thought, feel my breath. You know, where's the magical, esoteric, fantastic technique that's going to wipe out all my suffering? I came all the way to India. I feel my breath. That's <laughs> Anybody can do that. And I thought, eh, how hard can this be? And then it was like, whoa, <laughs> this is not so easy. Unlike my thought, like, oh, what will it be like 800 breaths or 900 breaths before my mind wanders? It was like one breath or two breaths and I'd be gone and I'd be way gone. And I kept hearing that there was something very important, really crucial actually, in the moment after we've been distracted where we need to let go gently and start over again without being disheartened, right? Or without judging ourselves or blaming ourselves. We let go and we begin again. And I heard that over and over again. I just did not believe it. But uh, I just read something last week, which was basically, if the training, it's almost like the muscle training is in the letting go and starting over, that's not gonna happen if you don't get distracted. So being distracted, being lost, getting sleepy, feeling, overwhelmed, that's not a problem actually, that's the training ground, we need that in order to actually 
do what we're, we're here to do. So we can have fun together, you know, um, each of us within our own experience and, and with one another, and hopefully really challenge some of those old paradigms of, of perfectionism or needing to have a certain kind of experience. And it is, it's, I know the social pressure. Everybody, we're here for a long time. It's a big investment being here, you know. We'd like to leave here and run into a friend and be able to say, well, you know, the first night was a little rough, but then, I don't know, I started practicing and it was just like this peace, this tremendous peace. It was almost like this, this indescribable, unfathomable peace. And then the peace sort of started shimmering on the edges. <coughs> it turned into bliss and it was like, <laughs> it was amazing, blissful peace. And, we don't really want to say, you know, my back hurt, and I was sleepy, and I was worried, and, you know. But there's a certain way in which, um, as we talk about meditation at any rate, the whole point is not what we're experiencing, it's how we are with what we're experiencing. So how much presence, how much balance, how much love are we bringing to whatever is coming up? And while it's more satisfying socially to be able to say what's coming up is all these glorious things, it actually doesn't matter. Because maybe our back hurts and our knee hurts and our head hurts and we're sleeping, we're anxious. But we are so different with those things than we have been before. That's considered really, really good. Meditation. So part of the challenge in being here is stepping out of our ordinary lanes of judgment, you know, it's not the same criteria that we usually hold ourselves to. Something very, very different. And that's fantastic and also challenging. So here we are. It, it's New Year's. And I love the um, Medicine Buddha, which I'm also going to ask Bob to describe as well as, I asked him to describe the Tibetan New Year because it's the one that has some, some meaning. But uh, I just bought a new car. Uh, and I have a car in Massachusetts. I spend a lot of time in New York City where I don't have a car. Uh, but I have a car in Massachusetts and the car was just like really falling apart, poor car. I was very attached to it. Uh, so I had to buy a new car and the car I bought, um, they asked me for my first choice of color, which was mulberry, which is like burgundy. Uh, but they couldn't get me a mulberry car. They got me a blue car, a dark blue car. I was sort of morose for a moment. But then I thought, that's the color of the medicine Buddha. <laughs> I have a medicine Buddha car, you know? Yeah, and I was yeah. extremely happy. So I keep looking at it, oh, that's the color of my car. <laughs> so can you tell us about the medicine Buddha? Oh, sure. The, med the Buddha, there's a... Um... Um, I mean, there's very way, various ways of telling it. There were sutras about the medicine Buddha. And um, there were seven brothers who, in another universe, like many, many aeons ago, who became medicine Buddhas. Which means that um, in addition to teaching the Four Noble Truths, as all Buddhas do, which how many of you know the Four Noble Truths, by the way? How many people here know the Four Noble Truths? I don't know, it's many, okay. How many have never heard really of the Four Noble Truths or brand new to the Four Noble Truths? Yeah, and then there's some that's sort of really in between. Have two or three? <laughs> well, Four Noble Truths is like a medical diagnosis, which the Buddha made his primary teaching. And actually, all of his later, most complicated teachings all fit into that. And basically, they are the that the unenlightened life is suffering. It will never be satisfactory. The cause of that is, uh, is fundamentally craving, anger, and ignorance. Especially ignorance is the root cause. And ignorance is defined not as just not knowing something, it's knowing something that is not the case. That, you know, knowing something wrongly and being stuck in that mistaken knowledge. But his that's the diagnosis of the cause. Then the prognosis is, however, one can free oneself from that with wisdom, meaning knowing the reality of oneself and the world. And then the therapy is called the Eightfold Path, which is like a whole set of educations, ethical education, 
mental education and intellectual education, science, like scientific, and nat about the nature of reality. And um, so all Buddhas teach that. So in a way, all Buddhas really are therapists rather than prophets, you know, because they, they contradict, uh, Buddha contradicted the religious teachings of his time, that, and uh, Buddhists would contradict other religious teachings in the sense that there is somebody outside, a god, or several gods, or a goddess, who's going to save you. And um, the Buddha said that actually, if the gods had the power to save us all, we'd all be saved already. <laughs> and we're not, we're suffering. So the reason is not that the gods are bad, they would like us to be saved, because the Buddha didn't disbelieve the existence of gods. He talked to them, actually, at least in the sutras they say he did, and they talked to him. But um, they just were not omnipotent and they were not omniscient. They were very knowledgeable and very powerful, but not omnipotent. So they just didn't have the power to save another person from suffering. So, or even themselves, some of them. Because they take, the problem with gods is they tend to become a little bit egotistical. Because they think, hey, I'm God, wow. <laughs> they get really excited about it. And, uh, Whereas Buddha is not, and uh, what a Buddha is, is a person who becomes completely aware of the nature of the reality, and by that complete awareness uh, becomes uh, free of suffering. So then has, is stuck in the very awkward situation of not being able to help others become free of suffering that way, just like a teacher cannot cause this, force the student or cause the student to understand. They can only provide methods whereby the student can themselves come to understand, right? You can't, many of you might be teachers, actually, of one kind or another. Every mother is a teacher, for sure, and I see there are many here who must be mothers, fathers. And you can't make that kid understand. You can give lots of clues and hints and, and um, reasons and so on, and then they will eventually understand, hopefully. And... Uh, so that's sort of what, that's a very tiny nutshell about Buddha. Then, apparently one time during his teaching career, 45 years long, that the Buddha had, he was in a medical mood, more physical medical mood, as well as mental and spiritual. And um, he looked at the world and saw beings suffering in the world, which he was not. He, when you understand this, you are free of the suffering, which is a surprise. And... Um, he was surprised himself. He said when it happened, he was rather happy. <laughs> Tell him about it. And then he felt, he saw when he, when he became free of that suffering by understanding the reality, when he looked at other beings, this is the funny one, when he looked at them, he saw that basically they were kind of made of that freedom themselves. In other words, they were, they were kind of made of energy in a certain way that if it was flowing, they would be, they should be happy if they knew their own true nature. But because they don't, they are feeling very dissatisfied and fundamentally they feel like alienated from the rest of the universe, you know, self versus everything else. And once you feel that, then it's a struggle to, to where, where, how is, what's my share here? What's my state here? Is the world doing what I need? Am I getting what I need from it? Uh, is it not bothering me in some way, consuming me in some way? And once you do that, then basically, it, 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 when stress is there, it's you versus the, every, everything in the universe, and you lose, of course. It's not even, it's not really a genius idea. It's very obvious. But whereas if you understand your relationship to the universe, and you realize that, in a way, it and you are totally interwoven, then apparently you, you don't feel alienated in that way and you're able to feel happy rather than suffer. So, but then he saw that a lot of the people he was able to therefore help in his lifetime who to teach uh, were not able to study what he was teaching because they were too sick. So that's when he got into a medical mood. Okay, I'm, I it was circled around to explain that. And the minute he did, he turned blue. <laughs> he turned dark blue. And there's a symbolic reason for that. The medicine Buddha is, uh, has this blue color. And uh, of course there's a legend where these seven brothers came from this other universe to help him out with the medicine teaching. So the, the seven are up above, if you in this painting, for example, they are the seven. And, um, and sort of let him be a medicine Buddha. 
And then he created a vision around himself, which is what this place is dedicated to, where temporarily in his field, everyone also felt somehow less alienated. And they felt, you know, normally we're worried about germs, we're worried in the woods out here, we're worried about ticks in the warmer weather, you know, we're worried about bugs, we're worried about the food, maybe something wrong with it, you know, pollution of different kinds. Right? We're worried about what might come at us from the outside in regard. Someone coughs, you know, we're worried we're going to catch a cold. Whereas the medicine Buddha vision is everything is medicine. The whole, all plants, especially the plant world is really. The medicine Buddha holds a plant in this hand, which is something called the Myrobalan plant. The, ter the Latin word is Terminalia chibulia, which are the, in Sanskrit they call the Arura plant, Arud. And there are varieties of it, and it's a kind of panacea medicine. It grows in India in trees, small trees. And he's holding a branch of that with several aru, the kind of nuts, I think, there, which they grind into powder when they make medicine. So he holds that plant. And he sort of, therefore, reminds us of our interconnection with the plant world. And, um, and so in his field, everyone suddenly felt connected to things, and that they saw the positivity of everything. And in his vision, even a poison in a certain amount, mixed with knowledge, can be a medicine, right? And then uh, even, even things that are normally healthy, if done in excess or in the wrong combinations, can be poison. So he had a vision like that, and then in that vision he taught a medicine teaching, uh, which is recorded in various forms, and uh, according to the Buddhists, it has influenced what's known as the Ayurvedic tradition in India, and eventually it becomes very interconnected in China and Korea and Japan with their medical traditions. One of the reasons that Buddhism spread from India everywhere was they never had any crusade or anything like that. And the reason it spread is that the Buddhist monks and nuns seemed to know more about healing people than the local physicians. And usually they healed an empress or a grandmother, or, you know, emperor, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Queen Mother or something in China or Korea or some one of the sub kingdoms of China, and then they would take an interest, and then they would take an interest in the spiritual teaching. Usually, when they learned about the medicine, when the medicine benefited them, and uh, so that's the medicine Buddha. And we have a meditation here. Maybe should we introduce that meditation? Sure. We have a meditation.